Hello, today we are discussing the anatomy and pathology of the jugular foramen. As always, this is not an exhaustive discussion of this anatomical subsite, but a review of the critical knowledge needed to evaluate this site. First, we'll review the anatomy of the jugular foramen and its relationship to the adjacent sites, the keys to identify the epicenter of any mass in this region. If the center of the mass is not the jugular foramen, ask yourself, if you're dealing with something from an adjacent site. There are three classic entities that can occur at this site. Other entities will not be discussed, but as is often the case, metastatic disease and lymphoma can always be a consideration. The neurosurgeon Roton created these amazing anatomic dissections, demonstrations of neuroanatomy that I'm going to be showing for the first part of this talk. would encourage you to look up his papers and his detailed discussion of anatomy, which can be helpful for reviewing imaging and understanding neurosurgical approaches. The jugular foramen is formed by the petrous part of the temporal bone and the condylar part of the occipital bone. The foramen has two parts, the sigmoid, the sigmoid part receiving the sigmoid sinus posterior laterally, and the petrous part receiving the inferior petrosal sinus anterior medially. Between these two parts is a fibrous osseous connection between the in intrajugular process of either bone. Note how the foramen is continuous with the petroclival fissure. Foramen is also well demonstrated from below, and we see how it's closely related to the carotid canal anteriorly, occipital condyle inferior medially, and again, we see the sigmoid part of the jugular foramen here and the petrous part anteriorly. On the left, we have an anatomical dissection from above demonstrating the skull base. We again see the two parts of the jugular foramen. When we remove this part of the bone and add back in the brainstem, cranial nerves, and the venous structures, we can see the structures which enter the jugular foramen, the cranial nerves, which are important to Remember are 9, 10, and 11, which traverse the jugular foramen. Of course, the jugular bulb. Laterally, we can see the cranial nerves, 9, 10, and 11, entering the jugular foramen, being joined below the occipital condyle by cranial nerve 12. And we can start to think about masses which can occur in the jugular foramen versus below the jugular foramen and how this will affect the clinical presentation. If a mass occurs in the jugular foramen, we'll end up seeing paralysis of the 9th, 10th, and 11 cranial nerves with involvement of the superior constriction of the pharynx, with difficulty in swallowing solids, paralysis of the soft palate, and anesthesia of the pharynx, with loss of taste in the posterior third of the tongue. You can get paralysis of the vocal cords, with laryngeal anesthesia and paralysis of the sternocleidomastoid and trapezia, and this would be most commonly caused by the differential that we'll discuss. If the mass occurs below this level or involves the 12th nerve, you'll end up with paralysis of the ipsilateral tongue in addition to the above findings, and then lesions below that level will end up involving the sympathetic chain and you'll get Horner syndrome. Another view demonstrating the vascular anatomy, where we have the carotid artery, jugular vein, all intimately associated with each other. And we can also see how cranial nerve 7 within the masshood is descending lateral to the jugular frame. And taking a closer look at the venous anatomy with more bones stripped away, we see the sigmoid sinus extending into the jugular bulb, which is closely related to the labyrinth. And again, the internal carotid artery anteriorly. Let's highlight a few key anatomic points on CT. Centrally, we have the clivus, and then you have the plateroclival fissure of the petrous bone, and then jugular foramen, often larger on the right side. And you see how closely related the jugular foramen can be with the middle ear. And you can tell how easily it would be for the jugular bulb to become dehiscent into the middle ear on the coronal image as well. Again, we see the close relationship of the jugular foramen with the inner ear, and we can imagine how an arterial venous fistula with a sigmoid sinus would result in a pulsatile tinnitus. Here's our first case. On the right, we see a mass just below the jugular foramen, and as we slide up, 
we see expansion of the right jugular foramen. Now this can be challenging because the jugular foramen on the right often transmit, transmit an asymmetrically larger right jugular vein. It's important on CT though to note that there is remodeling of bone. No, there is no osseous destruction. And to confirm our suspicions that this is a mass, subtly displacing the carotid artery anterior medially, we want to get an MRI. On the left we have T1, in the middle we have T2, on the right we have T1 post contrast. And we see a T1 isointense to gray matter, T2 hyperintense relatively homogeneously enhancing mass centered within the right jugular frame. The mass has a few non-enhancing sites, which are hyperintense on T2. The mass displaces the medulla to the left, and the growth pattern for the mass is best seen on the coronal image. Here we see a superior medial growth pattern coursing along the expected location of the cranial nerves, 9, 10, 11. This is most consistent with a nerve sheath tumor, such as a schwannoma. And this happens to be a schwannoma. Let's consider another differential consideration. Here we have a contrast-enhanced CT, bone algorithm, soft tissue algorithm, and a coronal image. There is a mass centered with the left jugular foramen, which demonstrates permeative destruction of bone. The coronal image demonstrates superior lateral growth of the mass into the middle ear. To better characterize this, we want to do an MRI. MRI demonstrates avid post-contrast enhancement of the mass and a salt and pepper appearance with tiny black dots on a background of white. The black dots are flovoids, which can also see, be seen well on T2. The flovoids and avid contrast enhancement are related to the intense vascularity of this mass. And if surgical intervention is planned, these also often require embolization. This is a paraganglioma. We talk about different subtypes of paraganglioma based on location. If in the neck, we call it a glomus vagali. If it's in the, the jugular bulb, we call it a glomus jugularis. If it's involving only the middle ear, we call it a glomus tympanicum. If it's involving both the jugular bulb and the middle ear, as in this case, we call it a glomus jugulotympanicum. Here we have our third major differential consideration for this location. On CT, we would see a permeative sclerotic osseous change, which was not present in this case. We see a homogeneously enhancing mass centered in the left jugular foramen, but also involving the left IAC above it, and it has a broad dural attachment and the small dural tail. This is most consistent with a meningioma. So we've talked about the adjacent anatomy, and identifying that the mass is originating within the jugular foramen is very important, as if it's originating from one of the adjacent anatomic subsites, our differential would be different. The three major entities to differentiate are paragangliomas, schwannomas, meningiomas. If the imaging appearance does not match one of these, we want to also think about metastatic disease, and lymphoma, multiple myeloma perhaps, and look for risk factors such as known malignancy elsewhere. Look for osseous change. Is there permanent destruction of bone? Is there a smooth enlargement of the foramen? Or is there permanent sclerotic change such as in a meningioma? Are there flow voids? Paragangliomas are highly vascular. And what is the growth pattern? Is it along the dura, like in a meningioma? Is it superior medial, like would be seen in a nerve sheath tumor? Or is it superior lateral, as would be seen in a paragangliomas? Thank you very much for your time.